So if you think about what is a data platform, for, for Cumulo, this is about first consolidating all of your data into a single software application. So getting it off of maybe multiple NAS environments, multiple end user machines, um, maybe you have some scale up solutions that have lit, run out of capacity, all those different things. Get your data just into a single scalable solution. We talked earlier about scalability can be number of files, it can be performance, it can be capacity. And Cumulo is really designed, if you think about those different goalposts, to be able to get everything into a single solution. And then as you want to extend your infrastructure in the cloud, to the idea of making that easy. If you've written API calls, if you've scripted, if you've integrated applications with Cumulo in the data center, um, as you spin up a Cumulo instance in the cloud, so again, the exact same software just running up in the cloud, all of that in integration you've done, whether it's from business management processes, chargeback, uh, data creation applications, will automatically work with your infrastructure in the cloud because we're using the same APIs, the exact same software. It's not even a different build of software. So if you want to extend to the cloud, maybe you're doing some burst computing, you're doing some content distribution, you want to test an application, um, you're running the same infrastructure in the cloud. And then as you start to think about transformation where you have your data now easily moved up into the cloud, but you want to make it available to different applications that are cloud native. If you want to be able to enable remote workers with things that COVID have driven, such as cloud studios for media entertainment, where video production is occurring in the cloud, you can actually transform by having the same tools, the same application, your data, all up in the cloud um, to really help you with that you know, kind of digital transformation objective. Um, from a motivation perspective, a few key things. We talk about the cloud a lot because all businesses are planning to use the cloud in some sort of way at some point. Maybe they're not today, but they will be in a couple of years, or maybe it's just one business unit, or maybe it's just their DevOps teams. But all companies are trying to figure out where does the cloud fit into their infrastructure? Um, and in some cases, it's a significant portion. In some cases, it's not. And having a file system that was designed to help them get there really is a huge differentiator. I think 70 or 80% of our business, it's, it's a number right in that area. It, the, the top three purchasing decisions is our ability to help the customer get to the cloud. But then the other decisions can be a wide variety of things. It can be um, real-time visibility into data. It can be that we offer all NVMe um, storage nodes in the data center. It can be that we're API driven. So there's a few different key influencers, but our ability to offer the data management across on-prem and, and multiple cloud, and then you add in all the enterprise features that are absolutely necessary for security, knowing who has access to your data, sharing it across NFS, SMB, having all flash arrays. Those are all really important too. So going into our architecture, and this is kind of an eye chart, there's a few key things I want to touch on here. So as you start from the bottom and you think about where is the storage, platforms for us are cloud native platforms, they're bare metal appliances. We are constantly looking at how can we drive more capacity density, more performance density, drive costs down on hardware appliances. Um, our software is available through both HPE and Fujitsu as their scale out solution. So there's a variety of platforms that we have available. For Cumulo, we don't want you to ever be hardware bound where your application will only run on a spe specified type of hardware. Or if you want to take advantage of evolution in hardware, um, new disk drives, new NVMe, new cloud platforms. We want you to be able to do that very quickly and not have to wait 6, 12, 18 months till a major code release. So there's a bit about how we've architected that we are truly software defined. And then there's also the bit that um, we have agile development. So if a new device comes out or a new platform comes out that we want to support, we can roll that into one of our bi-weekly releases and support that very quickly. So Cumulo is about flexibility, being very nimble, and having the right storage platform, whether it's cheap Active Archive, it's really high performance all flash, or it's running in a cloud native environment, we can give you that flexibility. And then as you start to move up the stack and think about what data management is about, data management really means two things. There's a piece of it which is moving the data to where the application resides or to where the users need the data. Replication, um, snapshot replication, um, capabilities like that that are really moving entire projects or types of data from one location to another. 
And then data management can also be about data protection, make, keeping copies of data, being able to roll back to previous versions. Um, all of that is built into the Cumulo file system. Uh, it's just a portion of our functionality. We don't license any of it as separately. Like Barry mentioned, we're a software subscription model, and that subscription includes everything we do. Um, there's no separate charges for any of the features or functionalities that we do. And then as you move up even further and you think about access to the data platform, in a lot of cases, it is programmatic. It's running across REST APIs, CLIs, where we have applications and machines writing data directly to Cumulo, and it's all automated. Um, in other cases, we're presenting things like NFS and SMB to an application. But in, no matter how you're connecting to Cumulo, all of that data is written to SSDs first. And the importance of that, and it was one of the questions just a minute ago, is not only does it give you great performance because you're writing to SSD, but that's where we start to build our capabilities to have real-time analytics. And um, Tim's going to show our real-time analytics so we can give a little bit more detail into what that shows for you. But this is all about if you've consolidated petabytes of data, billions of files into a single system, it's very difficult for an IT administrator to manage that, to know who's using the data, how quickly is it growing, am I giving the, meeting my performance SLAs to different business units and applications? And that's what the real-time analytics built into Cumulo is designed to do. Anytime you want to ask any of those questions in our GUI, you can real-time have information versus having to do a file system scan or tree walk that may take days, may not complete. Um, we've built, as that data comes into our SSD, that real-time visibility into the data. So this is a just a view of what that looks like. But the kinds of things we're looking for is being able to simplify administration, more predictably know how, how your system's growing, do things like charge back. So if you have consolidated multiple applications, you can charge the right business units for their usage. And then it's also being able to troubleshoot things like performance by client. Am I giving them the throughput and IOPS I want to? Or if my system's saturated and I have a process that's running out of control, it helps you to diagnose that. So it helps the administrators get much quicker access without parsing log files, without having to run complex log file queries, information into their system and how it's being used. Actually, just a quick one while we're leaving that there for a second. Uh, the one thing I'm really interested in, because you're talking about chargeback and stuff like that, there is the REST API. Um, is the metadata associated with files in your system uh, extensible? Like for billings, can, are there arbitrary fields that I can extend that with to go, this belongs to marketing, this belongs to production, or say this came from this retail store as its point of origin, things like that? Um, not to the level that you're talking about. So generally speaking, and Tim, feel free to jump in here, but um, generally speaking, the metadata that we're creating is about what's happening within the system and where did that data come from. Usually when we tie to a chargeback situation or environment, they're pulling that information and then they're the ones who actually know about which users are marketing, which ones are um, you know, sales, that type of thing. So usually it's more about us having information about the data and making it easy for them to say, okay, these IP addresses did this. Those IP addresses are actually associated with users somewhere outside of Cumulo. Um, Tim, is there anything you would want to no, add to that? That question comes up regularly. Yeah. Okay. That's a good, it's clear explanation, just making sure I want to know what, where I can fit it and where the, uh, where it works. Yeah. Really what our real-time analytics is, is about is we know a lot about what's happening with the data within Cumulo and we package that across and you can query that across our API calls. We have a, pro, and, you know, a lot of applications like that tied into our API and we have a um, GitHub community where we share a lot of this information. It's really about making it easy for them to have the information they need from our system so that they can associate it with and and I guess what I'll, what I'll add to that is that in a file system, a lot of times that level of metadata comes from the structure of the file system, right? So stores are writing data into their own store directory or marketing is writing data into its own marketing, you know, file system structure, right? So that's a yeah. lot of times that's where that comes from. Um, we've seen additional metadata like that needed in S3 because of the, the lack of that's, that kind of structure. That's but, where I was coming yeah. from actually was, okay, once we get to the object place, how do I make that uh, link? visible to uh, the applications and the users. Right, yeah. yeah. So let okay. me jump over to S3 and what we're doing with S3 right now, because it is different than, 
I think what any other um, vendor is doing right now with S3. And again, this is thinking about forward looking how do users want to use their data. What we really see the value of S3 being is the applications that are connected to it. I think I think Barry has said that there's about 2,500 different applications and services up in the cloud, an enormous number that are constantly being added and innovated. And some of those need to write to file systems, some of them need to write to objects or read from objects. And what we're trying to do is make it very easy for you to have your high performance, intelligent, scalable file system across on-prem cloud, consolidate your data there. But when you want to process data, whether it's AI or ML or whatever it may be, for business data, usually that's um, a project of data like um, a genome sequence or a, a run of data coming off a specific uh, autonomous vehicle or, um, you know, any type of, uh, it's a movie or it's a film or it's a set of images. And that's actually being created by file-based applications and that's being created in a Cumulo cluster in the data center or in the cloud. But then when you wanna do just using images, for example, some AI, maybe a spatial detection and images in AI, that you need that data to be say in native objects to be able to use the Amazon services to, do, to, to create that facial detection. And what Shift does is allows the user to specify this set of data. I want to make a copy in S3 so that I can process it or run my applications and services against it. We're not thinking about it as a, a tier or an HSM or stubbing into the into S3. We're really thinking about it as an equal citizen. So we're very intentionally making these arrows go left to right, not up to down, which means that it's a it's a copy of your data that you're using and moving into objects so you can take advantage of applications that need to write to objects. So we keep the native object format. Um, there's no file system that you have to come back through to use that data. We're expecting that once the data is shifted to S3, that's where it's going to get processed or used. And it may be deleted after you have those results with the primary copy being in the file system. So it's a different way of thinking about gain access to cloud services. And again, it goes back to why I asked Barry to talk a little bit about data versus storage, that we're not using S3 as less expensive, more resilient storage. We're using S3 as a location to get more benefit and value from your data. So if you're using S3 that way, don't you sacrifice performance? Possibly. Um, and that's again comes down to the data is being created. If you're thinking about really transactional, like an editing environment, things like that, it likely is still sitting in the file system. But if you're sitting in S3 and using it just to run cloud native applications that don't have access to file data, the performance is good for the ability to um, get information out of that data. So, yes, S3 is definitely slower. And that's why we believe. For performance use cases, data should sit in file. For transactional heavy read write use cases, you have to have a file system. But there are cases where having your data isolated and locked in file format slows your innovation because there's so many cloud native applications that don't use file. And that's really what that shift is designed to do is make your data available to any application. So when for use cases for shift, this is really all about innovating with file data. It's about also being able to use S3 for things like collaboration and a copy of your data where um, you, S3 has some really great capabilities built into the lifecycle policies of a bucket that if you have compliance needs and you have a set of patient data, um, one of our healthcare organizations uses it for this, that they'll have a set of patient data specific to genome sequences. They'll shift a copy into an S3 bucket that has all the lifecycle and compliance policies they need for protecting patient data, and they don't actually need that in their primary cluster anymore. Once they've finished creating the sequence and analyzing it, they can actually put in S3 and free up the space in their cluster and take advantage of all the compliance capabilities that are built in to S3. And then also, if you want to share that data, S3 is great for sharing data. If you think about a file system, um, getting access across DNS, getting access, user licenses and capabilities set up so that you have access to the file system can be complicated from an IT perspective. S3 is really great for sharing data. So if you have a project of data, Shell Oil is one of the case studies um, that Barry was going to talk through if we had a bit more time. You know, a great example is of oil and gas industry is you have seismic data coming in off of a ship. You process it in a very high performance cumulo cluster. And then when you want to 
take the results that processing, making that shift copy in S3 so that when Shell sells that to another oil and gas company who needs the research data, that's a great place to put the data for the, the sharing on a long-term basis. So it's really about being able to get access to data and be able to innovate with it with any type of application in any location and using the file system for what it's great at, which is performance, processing, and scale, and then using the object here or object target as a place that you can use for collaboration and processing with applications that don't write to file systems.